Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Chris Alexander is here. He's the Director of Engineering for Crawford Broadcasting. And not often do you get to spend an hour with a company's Director of Engineering to ask about broadcast challenges, solutions, and so forth. Chris Alexander coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio. Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to that light bulb right there at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here and glad you could join us on this beautiful spring day, beautiful across a lot of the U.S. here in Nashville, where I am. It's a beautiful sunny day, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we're going to try to build a little fire outside in the, in the, um, in the fire pit. Uh, this evening. So we're going to try to get that done here. Uh, sorry about my voice. I'm, I'm a little under the weather. I caught a cold uh, about uh, four days ago and I'm, I'm almost over it, but, but not quite. Hey, I'm in the uh, Telos Alliance studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. Big thanks to my employer, the folks at the Telos Alliance who uh, give me a couple hours every Thursday to work on and produce this week in radio tech and bring it to you. And of course, I would encourage you to check out my uh, employer's website at telosalliance.com. We got new stuff coming out all the time. I've been playing with uh, the new software audio consoles that are fully uh, in software, fully server-based. I've got a server here, an old Dell R710 that's running six audio consoles on it, and you you access them all with a beautiful HTML uh, graphical user interface. It's just gorgeous. I've, we've got some videos up on the website about that. And now we've got uh, a phone system. The VX phone system is now fully integrated into a Docker container. And you can uh, install that. And, and by the way, just to see how small of a PC I could put an audio console on, I have an old Dell Optiplex 755. And you can buy them all day long on um, eBay for 50 bucks. 50 bucks with a Core 2 Duo, you know, an, an old Dell. And wipe out Windows, put Ubuntu uh, 20.04 on it, and install an audio console from, uh, from, from Telos Alliance. It is so cool. And it just sits there and runs. I got, I think I got 24 faders on it. 24 faders. Okay, enough about all that. Anyway, I really appreciate uh, TELUS Alliance uh, for uh, providing me full-time employment and also for uh, giving me lots of toys to play with and tell you about. All right, enough about all that. I want to bring in Chris Alexander. Chris is the Director of Engineering for Crawford Broadcasting. And Chris, welcome into the show. Glad you're here. Thank you. Glad to be here. That uh, you're in an interesting looking place. That doesn't look like your normal office. Tell me where you're at. Well, I'm. Uh, <laughs> you caught me. You caught me at our uh, cabin up in the uh, up in the high Rockies here. So <clears throat> we hide out a lot up here. Uh, you know, uh, really year round, but especially once we get into the warmer months, we um, we hide out here a lot, uh, like really? a few days a week. Yeah. Really? Uh, what kind of elevation are you at there? About eighty six hundred feet right here. And I'm looking out the window, and the Continental Divide is just right over there. You know, I couldn't quite throw a rock that far, but it's not far. And what kind of elevation is the Continental Divide, at least that part of it? Oh, it's 12,000 plus right there. Really? Yeah. Wow. Snow cap. Snow cap. Beautiful. Just, <laughs> That's a, I That's think a great eight, place. 8,600 feet where you're at sounds like oxygen, uh, supplemental oxygen area to me. <laughs> but <laughs> well, <laughs> you, are, are, are well, you used to it? You know, I, you know, we moved here from Texas, 600 feet AMSL, oh, uh, 22 years ago, and it, it took us a couple of years, but we've definitely acclimated to it. And uh, since we spent so much time up here, we don't even notice it anymore. Hey, uh, we're going to get into some cool uh, technical discussions, including um, studio infrastructure overhauls. Uh, we're going to focus on co-locating AM transmitters, since um, a lot of AM stations are finding out that their transmitter site, the property, is now worth more than the radio station. That's happened in a couple of big markets. Some big stations have, have found that out. And they've had to go co-locate or move. So you're kind of an expert at that. We're also going to talk about uh, MDCL. 
Uh, that's an interesting uh, topic. And, and also dealing with telco abandonment of legacy services, including abandoning pots. So you've, you're hands on, you got some real world stuff. And uh, um, you also, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about it later, but Chris puts out this uh, local oscillator newsletter, which uh, has just the best minds in broadcast engineering, speaking on real world problems, issues, and challenges and how they fix them. Uh, and that gets put out every month. And I got to give a little uh, prop here to two different people. And I know these are kind of competitive, competing magazines here, comp competing uh, uh, publications. Chris is the uh, editor of Radio World's Engineering Extra. Do, do I have that right, Chris? Is that right? Yeah, I'm the technical editor of Radio World's technical Engineering Extra. Right. Technical editor of Radio World. And, and so uh, one of the cool things about Engineering Extra, of course, is it's just engineering stuff. Now, at the same time, uh, I need to talk about these guys at Radio Guide. Radio Guide is also technical articles, and um, Radio Guide's articles tend to go but tend to be a little bit longer. They tend to go in depth uh, a bit more. But you'll find great articles on engineering in both of these publications: Radio World Engineering Extra and Radio Guide. And uh, I need to tell you that you can find Radio Guide at radio-guide.com on the interwebs. So appreciate uh, Ray Top, and I appreciate Chris Alexander coming on to to talk with us about about these things. Okay. <clears throat> got that out of the way, Chris. Um, we're gonna uh, we got a few minutes before we need to take our, our first break. Um, let's see. Gosh, there's so many things we could we could chat about. I guess why don't we why don't we tee off this topic of co-locating AM stations, and we'll kind of tee it up here for a, a couple of minutes to find out you know what why you know first of all the why what precipitates what happens that makes people say you know we're gonna put these two AM stations together. Well, you know, it can be any number of things. You mentioned one of them is that you find out that your uh, transmitter site property is worth more, you know, than the radio station. That's pretty compelling. It's pretty hard to ignore, especially when, uh, you know, you've got a, a, you know, probably a struggling AM a lot of times that uh, really doesn't have much cash flow. And it's really hard to justify keeping it on that uh, that dirt that's really worth a lot more. <clears throat> uh, uh, another thing that happens a lot is you lose your lease for whatever reason. Maybe you don't own the property. Maybe the landlord owns the property and uh, uh, they decide that this dirt's worth a whole lot more for an Amazon warehouse than it is for, you know, a, a broadcast uh, tenant that's not paying anywhere near as much uh, as they, as they would be. So that happens sometimes. Uh, and there can be all kinds of other uh, precipitating uh, events, but uh, I think those are probably, probably the biggest ones right there. Uh, so many AM transmitter sites are where they physically are because they have to physically be there for proper spacing and so forth. So uh, if, if let's imagine you're a radio station and uh, you're come to find out that you're transmitting, that it, it'd be in your best interest to move, maybe your best financial interest uh, to move, but you're not sure, well, gee, can I move and how and could I co-locate with another station? Could we get, because this happens with FMs all the time. FMs are oftentimes clustered together in antenna farms where you get two or three or five or six FMs on the same tower. That's not unusual at all, especially in uh, metropolitan areas. So, um, but it doesn't always occur to us as AM station engineers and owners that, well, we could actually put these two or three or maybe even four AM stations together. How, how does one get started thinking about that process? Well, you know, this happens a lot more than you, you think. And, and my phone rings a lot. We own a lot of towers. We own a lot of tower sites. And I pretty regularly get phone calls from uh, AM owners who are in the situation just like uh, we just talked about there. And uh, they're wanting to know, could we uh, study your, uh, you know, whatever call sign um, tower site for the purpose of co-locating with you because we're losing our site for whatever reason. And so that, that kind of thing uh, happens a lot. But, it, you know, you don't have to co-locate with, an, with another AM. Um, recently, uh, uh, Hatfield and Dawson, I believe, uh, they did a co-locate on a cellular tower. So you can do that. I have one in, in uh, Detroit, Michigan, that is actually on a 1,000-foot uh, uh, FM TV tower. Uh, that has a, it has a skirt on it, and we feed that skirt, and it has some ground radials, and so uh, you know you can do it on an FM tower. Uh, some of the new uh, AM uh, rules have really relaxed the um, the efficiency requirements, so mm. it, it's not quite like you can uh, you know load up a bed spring and uh, <laughs> see how that works. Uh, but 
you really do have an awful lot of options. And of course, some of those, some of those rule changes were really designed to, to give uh, AM broadcasters some options in that regard. Are there any, uh, <coughs> excuse me, are there any options um, that would be unusual that may, may not have been unusual in the past, like some kind of a, of a top loaded uh, wire, uh, you know, be- between two telephone poles is, are there any unusual options? One should think you mentioned the cell tower, uh, and I guess this would be a, be another skirt fed. So any, you know, a vertical structure, um, can be, can be skirt fed in, in one way or another. Any other things that we should be thinking about? I, I would say nearly everything's on the table. If it, mm-hmm. if it is vertical and radiates, I think you could, you could probably make, make something happen if it had enough, uh, height. Uh, there are, there are some other uh, things that have been around a while, uh, things that are normally used for travelers information services like Valcom whips, the FCC uh, a year or so ago approved those for use above a certain frequency. I want to say 1240, but I could be wrong there. Uh, and, and, and literally you could, you know, I could set one of those up out here in the yard and, uh, and be on the air with it. Uh, and that would, that would give somebody a, a real option. Um, of course, there's the you know, the Kenstar uh, antenna uh, mm-hmm. that uh, you know we oh, yeah. we saw a few years ago. There's just there's just all kinds of things. So uh, you know, I think the best the best course of action is to stick with the conventional as much as possible because it's mm-hmm. going to be the most efficient. Uh, it's going to be the easiest to make work. Uh, it's going to uh, give you the most signal for the uh, amount of money you're putting into it and the amount of power you're driving it with and all of those things. But, uh, you know, if that's not possible, uh, you know, then you may have to uh, have to think creatively. I forgot about that uh, Kinstar antenna from Kintronics. Uh, that's what a pole in the middle and about four poles on the edges and with some uh, horizontal wires going out to them and they're fed in, in an interesting <laughs> configuration, right? That's right. Um, and then then I was just right on the front of this, this radio guide, this Heba uh, antenna that Grady Motes has been uh, working to, uh, well, he's finished the engineering on, kind of figured out this was popular or it was talked about 20 plus years ago. And I think it was an engineer, I want to say from Egypt, that was promoting it. And I don't think they had it quite figured out at the time. They knew they had something, but they didn't get it really, really dialed in. And I think Grady Motes has, has uh, with some help from others, has really got this thing dialed in. And so that is an option right there. They're getting some you know perfectly decent results out of that antenna design. Interesting. Um, so we're going to uh, talk about more of the mechanics of co-locating uh, uh, AM stations. You know, w- w- how close can they be? How far can they be apart from each other on the dial? If you want to put a couple stations together or co-locate with other stuff, what do you have to worry about if you're putting your AM on a cell tower? That's coming up in just a few minutes. We're here with Chris Alexander. He's the director of engineering at Crawford Broadcasting Company. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Our show is brought to you in part by my good friends at Broadcast Bionics. We'll be right back. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantech Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16GB of RAM. 
it's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. Thanks so much to Broadcast Bionics for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Go to bionic.radio to find out more about uh, Camera One. What a cool system. They've been doing this for a long time and, and uh, partners with a lot of things that uh, we do over at Telos Alliance. All right, uh, we're here with Chris Alexander, Director of Engineering at Crawford Broadcasting. Chris, take 30 seconds and tell us what Crawford Broadcasting is. We don't always hear about it, but you, you guys are a pretty stable company in the radio biz. Yeah, we've been around since 1959. Uh, I haven't personally been with Crawford Broadcasting that long. I've been with them for uh, almost 37 years now. Came on in uh, 1984 into my present job. But uh, uh, we are uh, we're kind of spread out. Uh, you know, we're on both coasts uh, and, you know, and right down the middle. And uh, I've lost count of, uh, of the number of total stations. I think we have... I think we have 36 total uh, signals um, on the air, something like that. (laughs) I guess I should know that, shouldn't I? (laughs) Well, sometime sometime I asked Sam Wallington how many that uh, EMF has. I'd like to see what he says. (laughs) I don't know if he has an exact count or not. There's a there there. Kind of like I'm not comparing EMF to uh, to 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 weeds or daisies or dandelions, but they sure seem to spring up a lot a lot of them. They, sure. they do. I think if we asked Sam that, he'd he'd look at his watch and and uh, and say, well, what, what time is it? You know, let, let, let me run the growth algorithm, and for this time of day, right. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. I gotta say, uh, uh, one thing that uh, I'm glad about about EMF, um, we are um, some of my stations in Mississippi are co-located on a tower with with EMF. And when the, they bought an FM station that, that we kind of wanted to buy, but we didn't have the money to buy it. So they bought it and they're not a direct competitor to any of our formats. And they seriously improved the transmitter site uh, on their own. I, I guess at their, own, at their own expense because the tower owner wasn't going to improve it. And so EMF made a number of improvements right off the bat. And uh, then the tower has gone through a couple of sales and somebody else owns it now. But uh, anyway, they, they've been a very good um, a co, co-tenant. Uh, there. So yeah, that's, that's always folks. good. Got a lot yeah. of friends over there. Great folks. So uh, putting, uh, we, you know, we've talked to Mark Persons about this a bit, but tell us what some of the important key factors are when you want to think about putting two AM stations on the yeah. same tower or towers. What, what technically, what do you have to worry about? Well, I guess the, the number one thing is your allocation. Uh, you know, what channel are you on and who do you have to protect? You know, and so are you going to be directional or non-directional? And if you can be non-directional, how much power can you run? And it, with that amount of power, can you cover the market that you that you want to cover? So those are your right up front questions. Uh, I the 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 one that I'm working on right now is uh, a twelve uh, twelve twenty in uh, Denver. Uh, the station has been on a lease tower uh, right in the middle of Denver. I mean, you just couldn't couldn't pick a spot more in the center of geographic Denver. Uh, it's been there for a long, long time, and uh, uh, it's a tall tower, so it's a, it's essentially a kilowatt station, but it runs at 660 watts because of the efficiency of that tower to pr- uh, protect the other stations. And so it's non-directional right now, and it really covers the market well. Well, that tower. Uh, this is another situation where the land's worth more than the tower, and uh, there's all sorts of issues there. So we've been given notice that at the end of our lease, uh, we're going to have to find another place to go. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I looked at the allocation, and I have uh, I have protections south, and I have protections north. They're not super tight, but they are of consideration. And, uh, of course, we already have uh, three other power sites in Denver, in the Denver area. And so they're the first place I looked. I mean, why go rent something if you've already owned something? Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, we, of course, wanted the closest in tower site, and that had to be the KLZ tower site. KLZ is on 560 kilohertz. It's one of the old, uh, you know, the old regionals. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it covers a huge area. Uh, and it, it has two big 400 and uh, 450 foot towers <clears throat> that are wide space, like 900 feet apart. And then, uh, 
And, and, and if it was just that, we'd be, okay, well, let's just uh, put another tower out there and we'll be good to go. The thing is, a few years ago, um, we did another co-location. And so I have, an eight, I have my 810 station operating there with a four-tower directional. None of them shared with KLZ. So we have, we have two towers wide spaced, and then we have four. We have mama and papa and four babies in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we already have two, and now I'm wanting to bring a 12, 1220 in there as well uh but from up there i'm gonna have to be a little bit directional to protect the uh the, mm. the stations to the north so that means i can share one of those 810 towers but i have to put up one more to achieve the protections that i need so you know it's a complex thing and it's going to be some expense involved but really the uh, uh looking at all the other options uh for that particular radio station and the allocation that's really a, about our our only only hope of keeping that particular station alive it's uh uh you know uh, it's an it's a low power am it's uh you know it's not just worth a whole lot and so you know there's a, a point of diminishing returns you reach very quickly so moving it onto our own land is uh is the thing that makes a lot of sense and that's what we uh we plan to do, but it's going to take some engineering uh, to do it. But those are the questions that you have to answer, ask, ask and answer up front for any co-location. You, you really need to deal with the, uh, with the allocation. I got to believe there, there comes a calculus where you wonder, do we turn this license in or do we in fact relocate it maybe at a, a lower power level? Maybe it's now it, maybe you have to make it non-directional where it was directional at a lower power. Um, one of, one of my stations in Mississippi years ago, we, we went, we got away from a directional tower site that an ice storm had taken down like, uh, four of the five towers. And we ended up going non-directional at a lower power level, but still covering the market that we just couldn't say we were the most powerful station in the Mississippi Delta anymore. Uh, it really didn't matter. We were covering the city of that we, of financial interest. So you got to do this calculus. Do we want to be a lower power station? Keep the license because who knows, maybe there's some FCC benefit to hanging on to that AM license somewhere down the road, maybe at some point a pipe dream, but maybe, uh, maybe they are able to migrate AM stations into the lower part of the FM band or, or something. I, you know, channel six area, maybe never, ever happened, but it would be, I got to think there's some value in, in holding on the license instead of just turning it in. Like some stations have elected to do because they didn't really feel they had another choice. Well, the obvious benefit is an FM translator. Yeah, that you could pair. You can pair with the uh, AM. Something that I'm seeing a lot of um, is, let's just say, a station has uh, multiple towers, like you said, and uh, they decide let's let's take down uh, two of the towers. Let's keep one. We have to reduce our power to a non-directional, whatever the non-directional allocation would would sustain. Uh, but it still covers it still covers the market, and and uh, and we have a translator and so that holding that am license allows us to uh to have that translator and the translator then covers really what they want and that that you know the am is the primary station uh, uh -huh. but the fm is what everybody's going to be listening to you know so funny there, you there's, that. That, there's value there yeah this is exactly what we did in uh, in greenville mississippi we had a three tower directional array for uh 13 30 a.m and uh, we ended up going non-directional. Uh, our nighttime power is just nil. It's very, very low. But uh, we do have the, we, we have a translator, and the translator is right on the 1 a.m. tower. We've even sold off property that has one of the towers on it. Now, the new owner hasn't removed the tower yet, but, but, uh, but he will. And then someday we'll take down the other tower. Right now, they're just, just, just floating. Um, as long as we're on this, the a.m. topic, so we, we, we see that you know, there's benefit, perhaps, in, in uh, co-locating or come up with an interesting uh, vertical radiator. Um, what about, uh, yeah, some years ago, we uh, talked a bit about MDCL. In fact, we had a, a gentleman on from Alaska who talked about uh, going with the MDCL uh, uh, modulation scheme, if you will, or power control scheme with AM stations. Uh, saving money with MD, first of all, remind us what MDCL is and, uh, and how does it work? MDCL is the, what the FCC calls it, and it's a good, it's a good acronym. Some people call it DCC for dynamic carrier control, but um, uh, MDCL uh, stands for modulation dependent carrier level. And uh, essentially what it does is it 
reduces the carrier level of the AM with modulation. Now it can go, it can go either way, uh, and there's different algorithms that you can use, and you can then select different levels of uh, compression. Uh, but uh, w one of them, uh, one of the algorithms, and I, I'm trying to remember what they are, um, but one of them uh, reduces the carrier when there's silence. Uh, and then when, when, there's, uh, when the modulation goes up, the carrier goes up. Uh, the one we use um, is uh, called AMC. Uh, I wish I could remember what that stands for. But uh, it does just the opposite when the, uh, when, when the uh, modulation goes silent, the carrier comes up. And mm -hmm. we did a lot of tests early on. And I'm, I'm talking going back um, 10 years probably when we were first experimenting with, with this and we had some equipment to do it with. Uh, we first experimented in the Bay Area with uh, our, our station is actually located over in the Modesto area. So it's a ways from the Bay Area, but it's 50,000 watts and it puts a pretty good signal, uh, you know, two millivolt, five millivolt really over uh, over the Bay Area. Uh, but it's very expensive to operate. Power is very expensive out there. And so we uh, we wanted to experiment with this and we did. But our concern was that will this uh Will this compromise the signal in the uh, in, in in the fringe area? In, in this case, over in the Bay Area, will people notice that? Oh, their signal's not as good as it used to be. And what we found was that the uh, uh, the AMC, which which uh, restores the carrier at silence, it has a benefit in that it uh, it keeps the receiver's AGC voltage. Um, it keeps it uh, down so that when so that when you uh, when you go silent, it doesn't suck up all this noise. And that's that's kind of what we found with the other one. Uh, so if the if the carrier goes away when the modulation goes silent, then uh, your carrier drops to like half. And now all the AGCs in the radios, it sucks up everything, and you hear all the static and all the different uh, all the noise and so forth. Yeah, uh, benefits uh, you know are just incredible uh we immediately uh year i'm sorry month this year to month last year we saw a one thousand dollar uh savings in in our electric bill that's significant and we've tracked that we actually tracked that for a full year across that station and then across others as we as we did it of course that's on a 50 kilowatt station you you know you do this on your 10 or your five you're probably not going to see you know anywhere near that much uh, of savings but if you've got a if you got a 50 uh, kilowatt station uh, running full time and you got a $10,000 electric bill, uh, you know, you reduce it by 10%. That's something. Yeah, it is. Uh, what, what, um, <clears throat> what transmitters uh, on the marketplace these days can do MDCL maybe with a software or a software and hardware upgrade. I'm sure Nautel and Harris are probably the big proponents of that, right? The only one I can speak to is Nautel uh, because it's what we yeah. use and I'm really not familiar with what anybody else is using. But uh, the Nautil, uh, not only their NX series uh, does it, but we actually have done it on their older transmitters, their uh, mm. ND series, by by adding uh, uh, an IBOC exciter because that's that's built into the that functionality is built into the IBOC exciter. Mm. Uh, so you know, of course, we run IBOC on most of our AMs anyway. So we we had that already in place. Uh, it was just a software upgrade. But uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying is any transmitter that'll take a mag and a phase input, mm -hmm. uh, you, you should be able to add an outboard, uh, you know, like a, a Nautel AMI box and switch on the uh, MDCL and be off to the races. You just have to notify the FCC that you're doing it. And I'm sorry, I said Harris, I should have said Gates Air, but I, I do believe I've talked to people who have uh, Gates Air or maybe older Harris transmitters and and they were doing M MDCL as well. It's interesting that you picked the, um, it makes sense to me, you picked the, the algorithm, the scheme, that when you have dead air, it increases the carrier to full to keep the quieting proper uh, for your listeners, helps your, your listeners. But that's an incentive to not have dead air, isn't it? It, it is an incentive not to have dead air. The, the advantage of the other one uh -huh. is that it maintains the same um, PEP power. Whereas you actually reduce your PEP power by the amount of the 
by 50% of the carrier with the one we're using. So you're really right. not putting out as much peak power. But the thing is, the power that you're not putting out doesn't do anything for you. Right. It's just exactly. a carrier. It's not carrying any information. So it really is wasted, wasted power. You, you want the power in the, in the sidebands is what we always said for, for right. AM, because that's where the audio comes from. Right. Um, th 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 but it reminds me of the old days of NTSC television with analog transmission. You know how the station would go to black, the power of the transmitter would go to max. And, uh, right. and so the, 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 oftentimes the person writing the check to the election would say, uh, can we not go to black very often? If you're going to go to black, can you put a slide up that's white or something? <laughs> It'd be right, interesting to you always get, the, you always get yeah. the sync buzz in the audio too when it went black because the power would go way up. That's right. That's right. You should have a, you, you know, somebody, somebody will do it. You know, have a Raspberry Pi that figures out uh, for every second of dead air on an MDCL transmitter with the algorithm you're running, uh, it, it costs you this much extra. There's a little counter of dollars that go up because you got dead air. <laughs> well, another thing that we found with this, and this is, a, this is a real consideration, is your auxiliary transmitter. Suppose you have MDCL on your main and something goes wrong with it. You have to do maintenance, it's down, whatever, and you go to your aux. And, uh, you know, you run on your aux for maybe uh, an hour or two while you're fixing the, uh, the main and you put the main back on the air and you think all is well. And then huh. here comes the electric bill at the end of the month and you fall out of your chair because that thousand dollars is back in there. Oh. And you go, what on earth? I mean, I just ran the thing for an hour. Well, guess what? You, you set that demand on your meter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they build that demand by the kilowatt. And so, uh, what we uh, what we have done, what we made it a, a policy, is we would run our auxes at fifty percent power. That yeah. way, we would not we would not push that yeah. demand up. Uh, since then, pretty much all of our auxes also have MBCL, so it's just not a not a factor for us anymore. But uh, that was a pretty hard lesson to learn, and and it, it'll sneak up on you. You don't know. You don't think about it. You're you're like you're in these markets where you got full power auxes anyway. But my, the stations I took care of. Uh, if we if we were lucky enough to have an aux, it was you know a, a kilowatt, whereas the main was fifty <laughs> kilowatts. So you know, it wasn't right. a factor for us. Yeah. Hey, uh, it's this week in Radio Tech, our five hundred and forty fifth episode. I'm Kirk Harnack. We're talking to Chris Alexander this hour, and I'm delighted that Chris could be with us. He's a hands on engineer, and he talks uh, almost daily with uh, his engineers out in the field in different markets across the U.S. and uh, just really keeps uh, keep, keeps a real handle on what's going on. So it's great. We got some more th topics to talk about coming up, including uh, the telco abandoning, abandoning pots. What do you do? Finding broadband alternatives at your transmitter site. And uh, in fact, we're going to hear about that in a second. And uh, site security in these days when, um, man, there are, there, are, there are gangs out there looking for, uh, looking for what you got. Well, we're going to talk about that coming up. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by Josh Bone and our friends over at Max Connect Wireless. We got a testimonial here from John Tocock. We'll be right back. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. Max Connect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the Max Connect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web and made us much more secure moving forward. It's also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. I'm loving these things. You know, my radio stations are in small towns, and we have uh, internet at our at our stations that is not exactly reliable. Um, you know, they tell us, well, a backhoe, uh, you know, caught our fiber along the Mississippi River. Well, don't you have another feed? No, it's the only feed that feeds the whole town. Max Connect has saved our bacon at our studios several times, providing backup internet service. Really appreciate uh, Josh Bone and Max Connect wireless.com you can choose your carrier if you have a favorite carrier or one that you know is strong in your area you can even get a 4g uh, lte modem that has two sim cards in it and uh, remember it's not the modem it is the service that makes the big difference there with prioritized data this week in radio tech is also brought to you in part by my buddies over at angry audio don't get mad get, get angry and you know they are experts at studio hub why because they own it they bought it everything studio hub is theirs and they're developing more new products. In fact, okay, check this out. Now, I, 
would you need something like this? Maybe so. Here's a female XLR. And it's hard to, there you go. Female XLR. And on the other side of this is an RJ45. Now, this would be great for either mono audio, because this is one, one female XLR, or it'd be good for AES EBU audio. This is going to get your audio from an AES EBU output um, on a device into the world of Cat5 cable. And you can run that easily, low voltage cable, uh, wherever you want to go, uh, but probably to the back of your, uh, your node or your blade or whatever uh, audio over IP device that you're going into, because those devices tend to use RJ45 connectors. And then here's another version of it. It's got the male XLR on the other end. And there, so again, good for mono analog or good for AES EBU. And if you if, if, if you just want to spend some money to hook, to hook two RJ45s together, you can do it that way. I wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Um, cables in all sorts of sizes. Here's a pre-made cable with an RJ45 at one end and a couple of female XLRs there. And of course, the <coughs> excuse me, the ones that I like are these, the ones that, that you use whatever length of Cat5 cable that you want. And, uh, you know, this, this may be a little bit more elegant for some folks. I just like the flexibility of having this dongle at the back side of, of the equipment that I'm looking to, and then use whatever length of cat five cable that I want to get to. It comes in male and female XLRs. You can get, uh, bare wires. You can get RCA plugs that would be unbalanced. Uh, you can also get a quarter inch tippering sleeve, uh, connectors on there. So all the usual studio hub stuff and they're developing new items as well. So you need to go to angryaudio.com and check out the studio hub tab. Um, but this is one of the new items that they have. Now, not many radio stations are probably going to use this device, but recording studios and other audio uh, places may. Uh, it just depends on what you need to, be, to do. It's got all RJ45s across the back here. And these, are, these come in a couple of varieties, some wired for stereo left-right audio, some wired for AES-EBU. And there's even a version here that's wired to the uh, AES-72 Type 4E standard, which is four AES-EBUs on one RJ45 jack. And that brings you to four of the XLR connectors on the front. These are available with all male, all female, half male, half female. There's several different varieties uh, for this panel from Studio Hub. It's an XLR breakout panel from Studio Hub. Check it out. Go to angryaudio.com and you can find out about all their different products. They're including the Bluetooth audio gadget, the headphone amps, the gizmos, the gadgets. They got a lot of cool stuff there. So check it out. Uh, angryaudio.com. All right. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Alexander. On This Week in Radio Tech, it's our 545th episode. Chris, oh, man, what are we going to get to next year? Um, fire well, mitigation. Let me jump into that. Let yeah, me yeah, tell you that my, my executive producer texted me during the break. Uh, it said AMC stands for Amplitude Modulation Compounding. Compounding. Okay. C-O-M-P-A-N-D-I-N-G. So, anyway, now we all know what it means. I'm not sure that there helps a lot, but anyway... Before we go into the next topic, I thought I'd throw that in. I'm glad glad we circled back and and, and put a period on, on that. Now now we know what it is. Uh, good good deal. All right, um, fire fire mitigation. You were telling me that at the place you are now at at the Alexander Compound on the on the on top of Old Smoky there in Colorado, uh, you had uh, some close calls with fire, and of course we saw transmitter sites get burned up in California in the last year or two. Talk to us about fire mitigation oh yeah we had a close call here last uh, october uh, some of you folks probably saw the east troublesome fire in the news and uh, how it you know it, it just it was a, just a huge fire and it came not quite to the property line here but pretty close and then turned north just by god's grace that it it went it went uh, you know north and around us and so we're kind of on an oasis here uh, of, of green everything looks fine here and uh, so we got a lot of critters in here, uh, including uh, mountain lions and bears and <laughs> everything else. It seems like we've got in here because it's where everything's still green. But, uh, you know, California has been our big fire challenge. Everybody's seen the news reports. Everybody knows how dry it's been out there. Of course, we went through a fire in 2007 on Catalina Island that was mm. just devastating. Uh, that just, you know, and, and uh, we eventually moved to the uh, mainland. Uh, we're on a mainland site now on a mountaintop in, in Orange County, uh, in the very, uh, very eastern part of, of uh, Orange County. But, you know, we're all the time thinking about fire uh, constantly and, and for good reason, because uh, it, it, you know, really from middle of June through 
the end of the year. This time it went right on through the top of the year uh, on into like January when there was a fire nearby nearly constantly. Uh, and they were doing power shutoffs uh, because of the, uh, because of the nearby fires. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have to look at a transmitter site and you have to see, okay, if a fire, you don't say if, you say when the fire comes through here, what's going to happen? How is it going to behave? What's going to, you know, and what can I do to mitigate that? Um, you know, and so uh, you, you want that fire to run through there on the ground quickly without, without damaging anything critical. And so uh, that particular site, uh, KBRT, um, when it was when we built it, we built it in uh, 2012. We built it for fire, so there's very little in the way of combustibles uh, there on the site. But we still have a big responsibility, and we keep that grass mowed, you know. And it's 35 acres, and it, you know, we have a tractor and a brush hog, and and we have a, a great team there uh, on the payroll that uh, that take care of that and keep it down, and then they keep it even more down under the guy anchors. Uh, you know, because you can really damage that metal if it gets really good and hot. We had that happen on, on Catalina. Um, when it comes up to a fence, uh, say the fence around your, your tower base, um, we use a, a fence with a PVC non-conductive coating. And, and that probably won't burn, but it'll sure melt and it'll make a big mess. And I really don't want to deal with that. So we, we keep a vegetation free zone about three feet either side of the fence. Uh, but you just look at every little thing and, and you have to maintain it. You have to stay on it. Uh, this, this year, this last fire season, I should say, uh, I kept, I kept being bothered by our transmitter building roof. We, we bought a prefab. If you think a cellular site, it's that kind of building has the aggregate siding on it. Uh, you know, and then the white, uh, the top of it is a white, uh, is a white, well, it's really just a, plywood deck with a membrane on it. And I kept thinking that, you know, if an ember were to fly in here on the wind and land on that, it would melt through that membrane and it could mm -hmm. set that plywood on fire. So I saw a vulnerability. So this year we put a metal lid on that, on that building. So anyway, those are the kind of things in, you know, in fire country that you, you really have to think about. You also have to think about your infrastructure what happens when the fire comes through and it burns up the power poles and it will, you know, uh, it's going to take them a while to get that fixed, mm. maybe days, maybe weeks. What are you going to do? Do you have a generator? Do you have fuel when the forest service or whoever won't, the fire authority won't let you in for weeks on end. Mm. Uh, you know, what, what are you going to do? And so uh, those are all things we, that you have to think about in fire country. You, you mentioned um, vegetation-free uh, spaces around uh, fences and around guy anchor points. You said three feet. Um, is, is that enough? Or what kind of space do you try to get between uh, forest or brush and, and and things that you don't want to catch on fire at all? Well, I don't want any trees on the property. I can tell you that right now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and I can't exactly go on my neighbor's land and start cutting down trees to get more <laughs> space. But my uh, property, our property, doesn't really have much of any uh, tree uh, by anything, by the way, of trees on it. Uh, because, the, you know, those are the things when they catch fire, they torch and then the embers are carried yeah. away. Uh, yeah. And then that's what sets spot fires ahead of the fire and propagates it. Uh, and that's what you, you really don't want. Uh, is, is, is three feet enough? Well, you know, we keep the grass very short on either side. And mm -hmm. so it probably is. I'll let you know after the fire goes through there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if you make it a whole lot more than that, I mean, these fence lines can be pretty long. And, and it's, it's a chore to keep them 100% vegetation free. Uh, you know, I mean, stuff grows up and you've got to be constantly pulling it. Uh, you don't really want to spray it. you got to pull it. You don't want it to die and then be a dead standing fuel ready to go there. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. So, you know, we could increase that area, but it would really add to a lot. What's already a lot of work. You, um, 
You mentioned telco abandonment of legacy services, and I'm sure I've heard of people saying, hey, they've, they're cutting off our T1 service, or certainly uh, we can't get ISDN anymore, and then they're cutting off what we have, or they've raised the price to, I've heard of $700 a month ISDN that used to be $70 a month. Um, how, how do you deal with telco abandoning uh, uh, their legacy services? And I'm thinking the answer is IP, but anyway, you, you tell me what you're doing. <laughs> well, you, you're exactly right. Uh, the the answer is IP, but we have uh, we have dealt with this. Uh, it, it kind of it kind of hit us. Uh, it kind of blindsided us. Uh, and believe it or not, the the first place we saw it really was SIP was Siptron. I mean, who would have thought that? Is that a legacy service? Well, here's the thing: uh, these these carriers are really pushing people to move to cloud-based service. Uh, and so if you have a premise-based phone system, like we do in most of our, uh, in most of our operations, we have uh, uh, you know, a, a uh, telco rack with phone equipment in it. Uh, you know, it, it's an internet service that then carries the SIP trunk or trunks into it. And then we do what we want with it internally in terms of, uh, uh, you know, stations and analog lines and whatever else we want to want to do with that. But they're really getting away from that. And I, I am told uh, authoritatively that uh, within the next three years, uh, you know, we're going to see the big manufacturers like, uh, you know, Avaya and, uh, um, you know, others that they're going to they're going to stop manufacturing premise-based systems and mm. forcing you over into the, uh, you know, into the more uh, cloud-based things. And, and so uh, the way that they, the way that they, they hit us was like you said, a huge price increase. And by huge, I mean like a six fold price increase. Mm. And they gave us a deadline and, you know, <laughs> we were just stunned by it. Uh, we've seen this with POTS lines. You know, uh, what, what do you think, uh, uh, Kirk, would be a, a reasonable price to pay for a POTS line at a transmitter site? You know, well, you use I, it to call yeah. the manufacturer or, you know, your remote control calls out on it or you call in and the remote control answers. Very little use. What do you think uh, a POTS line? In in Mississippi, we actually just, just, yeah, we just canceled three POTS lines at three transmitter sites because we were able to get IP there and for our older uh, sign systems remote control that want POTS, we just put a POTS adapter in. But we were paying um, 80, 90 bucks a month for each of those POTS lines, which didn't seem out of line, it's a lot, but you know, now we're saving you know, 260 bucks a month or so from those three sites. What were they wanting for you? Uh, in in Birmingham, Alabama, not too far, mm -hmm. right down I sixty five from you there. Mm -hmm. um, our AT and T bill for a POTS line at a transmitter site suddenly went from that level up to five hundred forty dollars a month. Gee, five hundred forty dollars, and then at another site, it did the same thing, and another site, the same thing. For long, all five of our sites are in the five to six hundred dollar a month range for these gold plated pots lines that get very little use, and uh, you know we can't stomach that. So, uh, yeah, I, IP is your option, but you, you got to find it, you know. And a lot of times, transmitter sites, it's it's really not it's not all that available. And, and I, I mean, you, every. I know everybody's situation is is different. We've been very lucky in Mississippi and Arkansas, an area that's not well served by ISPs, uh, but we have a relationship with a wireless ISP that covers most of the same area that all uh, 12 of our stations do. And so they get tower space from us and we get internet service. And uh, it's not always a thousand percent reliable. They're a small ISP. They don't get the full attention of the, uh, the uh, uh, providers that, that they're with. And sometimes, you know, power goes out, batteries die at a at a hop point. Um, but uh, generally speaking, it works. And that's how we get phones. And two of our stations have on-air programming, uh, one via a couple of Zip ones uh, uh, codecs and one via the um, the Omnia MPX node carrying uh, FM uh, MPX to a transmitter site. So, it, uh, yeah, uh, it's been a symbiotic relationship. And I would encourage people that you can either do your own, you know, IP radio link 
uh, or you can uh, you know, partner with a, with a wireless ISP. You need to do both and because yeah, your wireless, yeah. link, your, your own wireless link is going down just a matter of time. Uh, you know, it's going to, I mean, we, we have those part one-on-one links all over every, every place. And, yeah. uh, but they do go down. You have a big storm come through, uh, you know, and it can go down and, and, you know, you need reliable uh, telephone security, uh, you know, you name it at the, at the transmitter site. And so uh, yes, wireless ISP is a good, is a good option. It's not universally available. Um, other places you can get a cable drop, uh, but a lot of times they're not going to want to bring it all the way to your building and they'll give you some huge, uh, a quote on a huge price to do the construction, to bring it to your building. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're really, we're really getting creative. Um, you know, having them do a drop to a NEMA box that we mount just inside our property, you know, on a couple of poles and then in, they put their modem and so forth inside it. And then we use like a ubiquity link or something to, shoot that over to our building a few hundred feet away. Um, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, <laughs> things like that that you can do, but you, you just gotta be creative. You gotta think outside the box, uh, because otherwise you're going to be paying five, 600 bucks for a, a POTS line. You could be paying, you know, uh, uh, well, we had, we had some T1 lines in Chicago and, and, and they went up to, to like uh, $3,000 a month each. You know, we had to bail out of those. So, you know, you're you're going to be facing those kind of things, and you're going to have to be uh, you have to be proactive, and you have to be really creative. Think outside the box. You know, I, I kind of understand companies like AT and T and other providers wanting to get away from the myriad of kind of specialized products that they have that they supplied for for decades. If if you could, if your business plan could be, we're going to supply IP. Uh, and that's all we're going to supply. We're going to quit supplying, you know, the, the the stuff that requires specialized copper this or copper that or end devices or booster devices along the way. We're going to quit supplying that. You know, I may not like it, but I get it. And since now we can we can do almost anything we want to do over IP. Of course, some engineers will, will complain, and I get it that well, IP is not reliable at our transmit or at our studio or at our transmitter site. Well. Uh, hey, uh, uh, a friend of the show here, a guy named Dave Anderson, I uh, used to engineer for a group of Christian stations down in Florida. At his studio, he had four sources of internet, and one of them was a 4G modem, but other one, you know, he had four sources and a, and a router that would handle that. And then at each of his transmitter sites, he made sure he had two sources of internet, even if one of them was a, an LTE modem. And even if one of them was, uh, let's say they couldn't, just like you said, couldn't get a cable drop at the transmitter site, they'd find out, well, how far away can we get a cable drop? Oh, there's a mom and pop grocery store there. Well, let's go talk to them. Right. Hey, how would you like right. free internet? We'll pay for your internet if you'll let us put a little tower in the back of your house here and shoot that to our transmitter site. And and he said that that's where, uh, yeah, it's trouble to set up, but it, it works, it's worked out. Uh, and I, I know it may not be the reliability factor that a you know major broadcaster like Crawford would want to have, but it's, it, it, you know, all these things can be part of, of an overall plan. That's right. And you, you got to be, uh, uh, you, you need N plus one, yeah. meaning however many feeds that you need plus one. So, <laughs> so you have something to go back, uh, fall back on. And, and, uh, really those, and, and, you know, I think satellite inter- internet is, is a, uh, it, it has not been good to us over the years. We, we tried to use it on Catalina Island after the fire. And, and it really didn't work very well. Uh, it had huge latency issues and, and, and that was HughesNet. And that was, that was 2007, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but there are like Viasat, uh, Hey, they'll give you, they'll give you a static IP address. And, and, uh, they claim their latency is in the, in the, uh, uh, two digit milliseconds. Uh, you know, we can live with that. Well, uh, and, and, and with, the, with SpaceX, and SpaceX yeah. is putting up some, yeah, they're getting ready to, uh, they're launching a, a network. So those, those may be some real options for us as secondary or tertiary, uh, you know, uh, feeds for IP feeds or primary if you just can't do anything else. I've got one studio site in very rural Mississippi. Uh, interesting thing, though, it's the number one radio station in the county, which, you know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> may not be saying a lot, but OK, it, it is. And uh, I swear the DSL comes in on the top two wires of a barbed wire fence. It's just awful. <laughs> hey, um, site, site security, site security. This is kind of an issue when people are 
oh my goodness, people are hooked on all kinds of bad drugs and they want money. And some people are just willing to take and steal anybody else's stuff to get it. How is this causing you a problem and how are you, how are you addressing it? <sighs> cameras, 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 cameras. Uh, we put cameras like crazy and uh, uh, cameras are very good now. Uh, they're, they're really not that expensive and we're, we're rolling our own. Uh, we're, we are buying, uh, these, uh, five, uh, megapixel, uh, or 4k, um, IP cameras. Uh, they, we have tracking, um, dome cameras or tracking, uh, uh PTZ, uh, cameras mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I mean, it really works. Somebody comes in and you know, that thing picks it up and they lo it locks on and it will follow them. And of course it's recording it, uh, yeah. you know, and you can see what it is they're up to and, and all of that. Uh, and they're dual mode. They work very well at night with no light whatsoever. And then we've augmented that with, uh, infrared floodlights in key areas. No one knows it's there, but it's very, very bright. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the camera, so, uh, we do an awful lot of that. And of course there's motion detection on this. Yeah. Uh, at some sites we have Doppler. Uh, we have Doppler coverage of the whole whole site. So, mm. uh, you know, and, and, and we get a lot of nuisance trips, deer coming through there or coyote or mountain lion or whatever. We get some interesting video to go look at uh, when it sets off the system. Uh, but we've also seen, you know, somebody that shouldn't be in there come walking in in the dark of night and they take mm. a few steps inside the fence and suddenly strobes start going off and, and sirens start going off and then we see them turn around and hoof it back over the fence. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't, unless you've got some, unless you've got, you know, an, uh, an armed force that lives there all the time, you know, you can't really protect it, but you can take steps that will really discourage, uh, you know, those kind of things. I think that's a really good, uh, good way to go. And again, you can roll your own and, uh, you know, if you're so inclined, you buy the DVR, you buy these IP cameras, they literally plug into it. They have the DVR has POE outputs. Uh, you buy whatever size hard drives you want. And if you have IP mm -hmm. connectivity at the site, you can look at it, control it, play it back, you know, do whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do there. Um, uh, I want to know if you've got any pictures of uh, Sasquatch. Haven't seen that. We've seen some other weird stuff though. Uh -huh. we really have. <laughs> we've seen, uh, we've seen, we've seen mountain lions hanging around there and that kind of gives you a, gives you a little bit of pause and you think, you know, I was out at that tower just the other night and uh, mm. I wonder where that kitty cat was. <laughs> <laughs> but, Hopefully uh, off sleeping somewhere. Hope so, yes. <laughs> um, so I, at my own transmitter sites, uh, about two years ago, I tried some really cheap Chinese cameras that had their own app. I'm sure the video went to China first before it came back. I'm sure. And then they dropped the app. And so the cameras were no good to us whatsoever. Didn't matter how cheap, cheap they were. Right. So, uh, and, and I like that you've rolled your own. I haven't had time to experiment with different brands of cameras. I like the Rio link setup. I just, I like their quality. It's, it's, uh, you, but, uh, uh, we just put a bunch of wise cams at transmitter sites. Uh, we got yeah. the PTZ ones, just, we really don't need it, the PTZ ones. But the only thing I don't like about the wise cams is they're, they're Wi-Fi only. And so I had to go install at my sites. I typically don't have Wi-Fi. So I went and uh, the sites that didn't have it, I had to go put a cheap Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, the, the, there's, there's no ethernet jack on the back of them. So you have to Wi-Fi to them. And I don't have any outdoors yet. These are just indoors, but here's something else I found. Um, most of our sites have led overhead lights instead of fluorescent. And, uh, we have one site where somebody, it's a, this is the shared site. This is the, sh the site that shared with, uh, with EMF and some caretaker has been in there and shut the lights off. And so it's the one, only one that's not in color. <laughs> the, the other ones, we just leave the lights on cause they're led lights. They're so cheap nowadays to run and we get, get full color pictures there. Any thoughts about that? Well, uh, yeah, and, and I, I tell you, we don't leave the lights on, and I'll, yep. I'll tell you why. Bugs. <laughs> yes. Bugs love lights, and if there's a pinhole anywhere in your exterior envelope, those lights will draw them in like crazy. So we just go with the uh, infrared mode, and the bugs don't respond to that, and we're we're pretty good. So, yeah, that's we don't good, leave the lights that's a, on. Good point. And we've been fairly bug free up to this moment in Mississippi, but, uh, that is, it it's is Mississippi. It, it, it's about to change. Yeah. We know Mississippi is a bowl of moisture and bugs. 
So, yes, hey, we is. got one more quick, we got one more quick break to make, and um, and then uh, Chris, you know, I'm going to surprise you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't didn't brief you on this. We're going to look, we're looking for a tip of the week, something that you'd like to share. Maybe one of your engineers who writes in the local oscillator, uh, some tip that uh, it could be a website, could be a tool, could be something a great deal from Harbor Freight. I don't know, uh, or just a, a procedure that you guys find to be valuable throughout Crawford Broadcasting that you'd like to share with other engineers. So if you would be thinking on that for about two minutes, it's This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, along with Chris Alexander, with the Director of Engineering at Crawford Broadcasting. They've got 30-some stations all across the U.S., and uh, their engineers do a write-up every month in the, a little uh, paper called The Local Oscillator. I believe that is available to people who want it, and uh, I get it every month. It's full of great ideas and just let you know what you know what challenges engineers are coming are dealing with and, and what's how they're coming up uh, with ways to solve it this week in radio tech is brought to you in part by our friends over at broadcaster general store where you can get vox pro let's hear about it hey what's happening st john here coming to you from command central and wanted to tell you about the absolute best partner you can have in radio i'm talking about boom wheatstone's vox pro lots of different audio software out there why vox pro it's the only software designed to do what we needed to do which is record edit playback in real time when i say lightning fast i'm going to show you how fast you can edit stuff up in vox pro right now so literally three clicks on the controller mark left mark right everything that gets marked you hit delete it goes away it's literally that fast so we're going to take this part right here Boy, help. Nine. boom from caller nine to him saying i'm ready five I'm ready for that secret sound boom all of that stuff hit delete it goes away here's your edit you are tackling secret sound caller nine i'm ready St. John. So one of the best features of version 7, this is awesome, it's effects macros and you can literally put a chain of effects together so that instead of uh, having to normalize a phone bit and then uh, use noise reduction on it and EQ it and all that, you can literally build a chain. One button, this button, this one's called call right here, I just click that, all of those processes happen instantaneously. Final thing that I love about Vox Pro, and there's so much more to get into, but uh, one of my favorite things, you can load it on a laptop. I've literally done my show from a hotel room in Armenia to uh, the conference room at, yeah, this was fun, jury duty. Great thing, no one could tell the difference. Vox Pro makes it totally easy. I'm telling you, if you're looking for the best on-air partner, call my friends at Wheatstone, ask them about Vox Pro, and you'll be glad you did. I wonder if St. John voted guilty or not from the jury the jury room. Uh, Vox Pro is available at Broadcasters General Store. You can go to their website at bgs.cc. Or, you know, they are really set up well to handle your phone calls. So many places today don't want to hear from you on the phone because it takes up their time. Well, BGS is different. Broadcasters General Store would love to hear from you at 352-622-7700. That's 352-622-7700. For Broadcaster General Store, they have the time to talk to you. All right. Uh, we are just about finished with This Week in Radio Tech. Chris Alexander is our guest. And Chris, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I forgot once again to brief you on the fact that we'd like a tip of the week. Can you help us out? I can. Um, oh, good. Oh, good. And this is, this, is, this is something I haven't personally seen, but it's something that was discovered by uh, one of our uh, excellent engineers uh, in Birmingham. And it is, a, it's, an, it's an app, it's called Paceler, P-A-E-S-S-L-E-R, P-R-T-G, Network Monitoring. And uh, it's an app you can have on your phone. I think there's a PC uh, app as well. And, you, and, and it's, it's free, and you can monitor free up to 100 devices, SNMP. And you can have this and just carry it around with you and have it keeping an eye on transmitters, transmitter sites, microwave links, whatever it is, and just have it right there on your phone. Um, and it's really an amazing uh, thing. And I'll, I'll tell you what, folks, if you want to go to our, uh, our website, which is CrawfordMediaGroup.net, and then you click on the uh, About link and then go to Engineering and scroll down, you'll find all the... Uh, well, the last few years, anyway, of, of the local oscillator. And in the April issue, um, you, you'll find a write-up about this. And we're going to have, uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming months, I, I don't know if we're going to get this probably in, in the August issue, uh, we'll have a full write-up on it in, uh, uh, in Radio World Engineering Extra. But this is the kind of thing you can have on your, on your hip and, you know, on, their, on your phone there, and suddenly... Uh, uh, a codec stops pinging or responding to a ping 
mm -hmm. and you know, oh, I've got a problem. The codec at the you know, at the FM site is not responding. And you know about it long before your phone starts ringing. And, uh, you know, you can jump on there and deal with it. So anyway, uh, Paceler PRTG Network Monitoring. I rem I actually, I've used this before, and it, it's great. And I tried to use it before I knew anything about SNMP. And so I, it, it monitors a few things for me. In fact, I think it'll monitor stuff It'll if you have devices that... Um, that uh, uh, throw off alarms using syslog. I think Paceler does that as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure it does. So syslog or SNMP. Yeah, I, I don't know about that, but uh, Todd's mm -hmm. going to tell us all about it. And mm -hmm. he did a pretty good write-up there in the April oscillator. So uh, oh, anyway. Just, eight, eight, just the, this is the very last local oscillator, right? Well, two, two ago, with the, the April issue, May issue. Oh, the April one. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I will put a link to that in the show notes so people can find that easily. And thank you for making those local oscillator editions available online. I, I, I had forgotten that they were available online. I get mine in the email. Thank you. Uh, but that's really, boy, there's a lot of good stuff uh, saved back in there. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, the whole idea behind that is to uh, just to share information, you know. And uh, we share a lot of stuff, and then we hear from folks, too, and it's all very helpful. Chris, thank you very much for being our guest today. I, I express my humble gratitude to you. I know that you had a busy day and you've got more to do as soon as we sign off here. So hope you get things right. fixed. Hey, who could be better at it than, than you know, uh, director of engineering dad? And, and, and Amanda's good with this kind of stuff, too. So you got a crack team there. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, my, my wife and not just my wife, but other people, they, what they tell me is if I can't figure something out, they say, ask your daughter. So she, she's become my go-to. I just, I just ask her and she figures it out, including how to get me on here where we can be on, you know, she, she could sit here and work for a while to get everything working. So we owe oh. Amanda Hopp uh, uh, a debt of gratitude for getting us on today. We don't have asked her about being, uh, I've asked you to ask her about being a guest on the show and she hasn't been real excited about that. I think she's a little shy. Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe you can convince her someday because we'd love to have her be a guest on the show as well. Yeah, maybe if we do it together, she would do it. Well, I'll have go. to ask her. Yeah, so, you, can, you, you can hold her hand. And, and then when she's, when she's not looking, I'll get up and leave. <laughs> be great. Oh, Chris, thank you so much. And these are great items for our show notes. So uh, go to the show notes and, and look in there. Chris Alexander, Director of Engineering, Crawford Broadcasting. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you being here, and I'll send you some links about the show later on. Oh, hang on. Don't hang up yet, because we gotta we got to take a picture. Uh, our show's been brought to you in part by some great sponsors. Go to them. Let them know about This Week in Radio Tech. Please tell your friends. If you're watching on YouTube, please uh, like and subscribe. Uh, got to do that. And, uh, and, and you hit the little bell and get notified when there's a new This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks to Suncast, the producer of the show. Really appreciate the great job that he does every week. And thanks also to uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, home of lots of great podcasts. We got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.